Hi, everybody. We're back. This is Dave Vellante with Jeff Kelly. We're here at the MIT Information Quality Symposium at the Tang Center on the campus of MIT. We're here for two days in Cambridge, Massachusetts. This is theCUBE. You're watching live. In theCUBE, we go out to the events. We extract the signal from the noise. We've covered big data now for the last several years, but there's an aspect of big data that we felt we had not been covering adequately, and that's the issue of data quality and information quality. It's not a new topic, but it's certainly new for a lot of the big data themes that we hear in the industry. We talk a lot about technologies and Hadoop and, and Flume and Pig and Scoop and the things like that, but we don't talk enough about the practical realities of implementing data architectures and specifically data quality. Derek Strauss is here. He's the chief data officer of TD Ameritrade, obviously in the financial services industry and somebody who I'm sure cares a lot about data quality. Derek, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Yep. So talk a little bit about your role as, uh, as, as CDO. Is it, a, is, it a, is it a relatively new role uh, at Ameritrade? Has it been around for a while? It's, it's pretty new at uh, TD Ameritrade. It's uh, just over a year old. Yeah, okay. It was created when I joined. So you brought the, 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 the notion to Ameritrade? At yeah, TD Ameritrade, or I, I was did fortunate. Did you sell them on it? Or yeah, how did yeah I was fortunate to uh, have worked with uh, the chief operating officer of TD Ameritrade in a couple of other lives previous to this, and I was a, I was a consultant, so I was a trusted advisor to him. Mm. And so, to a large extent, I had uh, you know a, an opportunity that I think a lot of people would, would love to have, where you've got um, essentially a, a boss that you're going to be working for uh, who already understands what the end goal is and S understands you, and you understand him. Sought you out, said, I, yes. I need you to help <laughs> me fix this problem. So what was That's the problem? Right. So the, the problem is really uh, that a lot of organizations uh, in, in the financial world, and certainly TD Ameritrade is, is no uh, exception to this rule, um, have has a, a big emphasis on you know, systems and uh, applications and, and things like that, but not really a, a focus on data and information. And with the rise in, in requirements to really have a good focus on analytics and, and really strong uh, analytics, not only for internal consumption, but also for to provide insights for our customers, for our clients, um, there, was a, there was a need to do something about data. And uh, it was clearly a need that was enterprise-wide. And so that was the real driver to, to get someone who could focus across the enterprise not be part of IT, but not necessarily be part of any particular part of the business. So reporting up to the chief operating officer who also has a back office and various other business functions, uh, as well as IT. So IT is my, are my peers, uh, as well as various business functions. We've heard that actually before today, that, that it's probably not the best idea to have the chief data officer report to IT, because it really shouldn't be just an IT function. That's almost, we'd be creating a yet another stovepipe. We've got to, Correct. even though IT does cut across the entire organization, when it comes to data, you want people that are going to go out and talk to the constituents that are going to be consuming that data. Those are essentially your customers. So is that how you spent your, a, a better part of your first hundred days? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, in fact, the, the folks that are, that, are, that are drew out of the IT functions into my area didn't see me for the first <laughs> hundred days or more, actually because uh, a lot of it was spent out with the business folks, uh, trying to understand where the problems are, you know, where the pain points are in the operational systems and the, in the turning of the, of the enterprise, uh, as well as looking at the analytics needs. You know, where are the uh, you know, analytics issues? Uh, you know, what are the real needs in terms of moving into big data, for example? Uh, but even just looking at, at standard transactional data, and being able to get authoritative sources, and getting accurate data, getting <coughs> data that's actionable, and, uh, and, and getting data that's accurate. You know, so, sorry, I said that. A actu actionable, accurate, and accessible. Accessible, <laughs> there you go. Beforehand, <laughs> I was telling him about the three A's, and I went blank on accessibility. <laughs> uh, 
So, yeah, those, those three A's were the things that emerged from the discussion. But so when you talk to these folks in your first 100 plus days, um, I'm, I'm sure it wasn't as simple as them saying, okay, here's the problem, you know, bang, go fix it. You, maybe they pointed to the rock and you had to go look under the rock and then find. Correct. Because right, they, they, they were telling you about the symptoms, symptoms. not the problem. Yeah, that's right. So you've got to dive deeper and, and try and figure out of the, you know, of the 50 or 60 major issues that were raised, what are the common themes? And, and looking under those rocks to find out what's the fundamental cause of all of those things. And, and, and I think that's where we, we essentially found those three key themes. So how did you prioritize which ones you went after? I mean, you don't have unlimited resources. You got right. the, on the one hand, you got the ones that are easy to fix and, and common in a bundle, and then you've got the ones that are maybe going to drive business value, and then maybe the ones that are really harder to fix that are going to drive business value, others that have a risk factor associated with them. You've got this fairly complicated yep. matrix of decisions that you had to make. How did you simplify that and attack that problem? Well, you know, at the end of the day, it really came down to uh, everything kind of started vectoring in onto, onto actually <laughs> a handful of data attributes. That if we felt like if we could get those right, a lot of those the old eighty twenty rule. <laughs> we start, we start, you know, <laughs> getting really positive effect from it, uh -huh. and I think it's a it's a typical sort of engineering approach that you know when you get a lot of complexity, you very often if you really analyze it, you can reach down and you can find just a couple of key things that if you hit them, you're really going to you know drive everything a little bit further forward, and that's that's the approach uh, just to mm. take those, incrementally expand on that. So I wonder if we can go back to uh, the, the communication you have with the uh, the business side of, of the house. So we've yep. talked to some other CDOs today, and it it's interesting that the really the first focus of a CDO really is, uh, is around the business, not necessarily the data. Mm -hmm. um, how do you continue to, to continue that dialogue? Because it's certainly not you know your first hundred days you're in there uh, really intensely trying to understand the problems and the issues facing the business, but that's an ongoing conversation you've got to have. How do you approach that? Um, you know, we heard this morning from uh, Dat Tran, the VA, talking about you've got to have uh, a strategic communication uh, strategy, meaning you've got yes. to talk to the priorities of the different stakeholders in the language that they understand. Mm -hmm. How do you approach that? Pretty much the same way. Uh, I, I listened to a, a presentation that Dat gave on that, and it was, uh, you know, it was amazing. It fitted very nicely <laughs> with, with uh, the kind of um, strategies that, that we're employing as well. Essentially, to you know, to try and, and find a common thread across all the different priorities. So, you know, uh, you've got the various vertical parts of the business, and then you've got also the functions that support those, like the CFO, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's looking for that, that common thing that all of those constituents are finding that they, it's just a, an impediment to being able to really make progress. And then keeping up that dialogue and saying, okay, so so what are your strategic goals for the next, you know, six months, six to twelve months, and and what are the things that that you see as as really important, and and of course in any business every quarter, everything changes again, mm -hmm. so <laughs> you're going to make sure that at least every quarter you get down to having really good, quality dialogue, with all the key business leads, and and, and make sure that you know. Last last quarter when I spoke to you, this is what you said. Uh, is that the same mm -hmm. today? Um, so we keep on k taking course corrections mm -hmm. depending on how the business is changing. Mm -hmm. And and how do you prioritize your? Um, so well, let me back up. So we talked to uh, some folks today. Stuart Madnick uh, joined us and talked a little bit about um, CDOs can sometimes serve as a uh, you know listening to the business. They have a problem. We try to solve it. Uh, but also even more strategically saying we're, we're going to proactively go out and try to find ways that data can help us improve our business. Mm -hmm. um, is that a, the approach you take? Do you try to balance those two? Uh, and how do you do that? Yeah, absolutely. Th there has to be that balance. Now, um, one of the key ways that we're uh, focused on that is, is essentially on the analytics side. Mm -hmm. um, and when it comes to big data, of course, the, the, the main question that people ask is, is this really useful? You know, is all the, the effort that we're going to put into this going to be going to reap us benefits at the end of the day? And you know, in some corporate cultures, it's very difficult to get budget to try something. 
um, where it's not a clear, oh yeah, we're going to make X ROI out of it. Um, fortunately, we, we have a, an innovative culture and um, we've been able to set up a lab environment where we can try out various things. We can bring various types of big data together. We've, uh, we've got um, associations with some you know, external parties, you know, like some of the universities with real heavy re research uh, type uh, folks, uh, utilizing some of their resources, some of our resources in our lab with our data, we can start uh, making some progress in terms of showing and demonstrating some of the real nuggets that are sitting inside of this data. And, and the approach is really to use that as a way to uh, demonstrate to the rest of the organization the value so that they start exposing more and more of their analytics teams to some of the tools and capabilities that we're standing up. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, kind of in, in almost inflaming the imagination, saying here's some of the things that we could potentially do and getting the business involved sounds like is, in, is critical not just to the, you know, Help it, we'll help you solve your problem, but let's let's innovate together, co-innovation uh, with the business. Yep. yep. Um, so you mentioned kind of you know there's the tr traditional data, kind of the, the traditional structured data we all know of uh, in the enterprise, and then you've got this big data, uh, new sources like social media and other things. But in a lot of organizations, even just the traditional data that's in house isn't being used to its full effect. Um, right. How do you go about? Uh, well, what advice would you have to other CDOs or others uh, data professionals in terms of when is it time to try to make the most of the data you already have in-house, and then when is it time to maybe start looking elsewhere for, for bringing in new data sources and actually starting to do some of that innovation? That's a great question. A lot of people ask that because, you know, it's, it's almost like we haven't even figured out what to do with our structured data yet before, you know, so forget about that big data <laughs> stuff. We just got to get this right. Well, if you take that approach, you'll never get into that because you'll <laughs> never get this right, you know? There's no such thing as perfection. That job will never be 100% done. Absolutely. So, so our, our approach is basically hit them both simultaneously, mm -hmm. and and you know, uh, start small, you know, in both places. Um, most organizations that I've had the uh, opportunity to to work in as a consultant, because I had three decades of consulting before I joined TD Ameritrade. Um, have you know this the same kind of scenario uh, where there are massive opportunities in the unstructured data world because it's like it's again it's the 80 20 rule you know there's there's so much out there um, that people just haven't tapped into at all and you know especially using some of the uh, the graphic uh, or, or graph or network and analytics capabilities mm -hmm. that a lot of the the tools and appliances have got these days, um, you can really start uh, uncovering some of that pretty rapidly. Mm -hmm. You know, within the course of a couple of months, you can have some really striking and compelling um, uh, pictures starting to emerge that'll capture people's imagination. So Derek, you've been on the faculty of the Data Warehouse Institute, um, so you know a lot about the, the traditional data warehousing world. There's a there's a lot of people emerging that say, oh, data warehousing, it's, you know, this dinosaur and that whole business is dead and, you know, Hadoop is the new way. So I right. I'd love to get your perspectives on that. I mean, that's obviously, it's, I'm overstating that, but at the same time, there's disruption going right. on in that traditional right. business. And in many ways, the, the whole business intelligence data warehousing business failed to live up to some of its promises, you know, 360 degree views of the business, that never happened. And, and a lot of executives, CEOs that I talk to are very frustrated mm -hmm. by, and I talk to some of my clients, they say it's like a snake swallowing a basketball. We can't keep, you know, right. on top of these things. And then all of a sudden this Hadoop thing comes along and it just makes things even, even harder. So how do you see, do you, do you see those two worlds reaching in equilibrium? Obviously people are trying to force them together and, and it will happen. There, there's some type of equilibrium will be reached, but how do you see that evolving? Um, I see it actually as a natural uh, evolving uh, scenario because data warehousing, the, the purpose of data warehousing was really to perfect the data into the warehouse and to keep it for long historical views to look at trend analysis. Unfortunately, a lot of people 
thought, well, it was great for helping us do that. Now let's make it do a whole bunch of other let's things go real that time. it was <laughs> never <laughs> supposed to do. <laughs> so, so that's where you get the, you know, the problems. So, so now with all the big data stuff coming along, the worst thing that people could do is to try and cram all of that into the data warehouse. Yeah. Yep, stop the madness. Let's, <laughs> let's use data warehouse for what it's intended for, but then let's build alongside of it you know, another type of data store, and, and the, the phrase that I've coined around it is the data marshalling yard, because we're marshalling a whole lot of data into that uh, area, and it's very different from the data warehouse. It coexists with the warehouse. In fact, in many ways, it can front end the warehouse, because by using the marshalling yard and looking at big data uh, and doing the analytics on it, we're going to be able to do exploration and discovery. We're going to be able to find signals and patterns in the data. And once we've done a bit more further discovery on it, we'll be able to determine whether, hey, this piece of data that we've found a signal in is actually something that we would like to perfect and take into the data warehouse. The rest of the stuff, we haven't found anything in it yet. So we're not going to put it in the warehouse. We're going to keep it in this marshalling yard. We'll persist it, we'll keep, we'll keep history on it, because at some point in time, maybe there'll be other data that we'll have in this marshalling yard, which combined with some of the stuff that we didn't immediately find useful, now makes it useful. And ah, now we can take that and move that to the warehouse. So I see the two as very complementary. Uh, the warehouse continues to be the place where you've got uh, data that needs to be in acid form, in other words, needs to be atomic, it needs to be yep. you know, rock solid, a and, and the, uh, the marshalling yard is more uh, you know, raw data, but also data that has maybe had context added to it so that it becomes disambiguated, so it can be, it can be sensibly used. More value, so, yeah. so the, the marshalling yard is this, this filtering system, you pull out the nuggets that you really want, those go into the the data warehouse, and that's right. where the, the the single version of the truth, to, to the extent that you can get one, <laughs> right. lives. Uh, at the same now, you mentioned you brought me brought up another you know notion here. A lot of people claim that much of that new type of data, that the, the nouveau data, as right. uh, as some people <laughs> have, have yep. called it, um, that doesn't need that those acid properties. So mm -hmm. what do you do with that data in that point? Do you still put that into the data warehouse? Is that an that is that a, is that a advisable practice? Do you create some new structure? What, what do you advise there? I would keep that in the, in the marshalling yard, essentially. Mm -hmm. I, I would only put data into the, into the warehouse that needs to be in the warehouse, where mm -hmm. there's a specific need for it. Because it, it costs money to do it. it yeah, it's expensive, it's right. It's a, it's a container. It takes time, costs money <laughs> to put that data into the warehouse, because you've got to perfect it, you've got to normalize it, you've got to cleanse it, you've got to do all sorts of wonderful things to it. The stuff that's kept <coughs> in the marshalling yard is kept in its natural and state. And how do you see the extent. tip of the balance, of the, of the balance of value between the marshalling yard and the data warehouse? Because today, or historically, all the values in the, in the data warehouse, there's plenty of value out there, you just couldn't get it. Right. Now, with the marshalling yard, you're actually able to extract more, what we like to say, signal from the noise. So there's mm -hmm. more value in the marshalling yard. Do right. you see, and, and, and in some respects, the marshalling yard today, with all this Hadoop you know, fever, is is like a tail wagging the dog. Mm. Do you ever see that the marshalling yard becomes the dog? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think you just get two breeds of dog. Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> 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 and I think the, the marshalling yard becomes the, the Great Dane. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and and the, the other ones, the miniature poodle. And they're they're, <laughs> but they're but they're still a pack animal that coexists. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I good. wonder, you know, being in uh, financial services, and we've also had uh, some folks from the healthcare uh, sector, both heavily regulated. Right. Uh, I wonder how does that impact what you're able to do from a data perspective, and and does that put constraints on what you what what you'd like to do? Uh, how do you, as a CDO, specifically deal with some of the new regulations that have come along, you know, the Dodd-Frank Act and others uh, that are surely going to come along in the future? Um, how does that impact the types of analytics and data workloads you potentially could do? And how do you how do you make sure that you're, you know, following all these regulations mm -hmm. that are often changing and um, some are ambiguous to begin with? So right, yeah, yeah. I mean, the the, the workload 
in terms of being able to keep up with all of that and to and to stay, you know, on the on the right side of mm. the law <laughs> and <laughs> compliance uh, is is horrendous in the financial industry. And so, you know, we like like most uh, financial organisations, are members of various groups to try and stay on top of it. Uh, we uh, w we're working with the EDM, EDM Council as well, and uh, you know, getting most of our sort of perspectives. Um, from networking with, with folks like that. Um, it, it is, you know, uh, it is a f a, it's certainly a fact that it, it does take a lot of our resources. So there's a lot of innovative stuff that I'd love to do, but, you know, have a limited amount of resources. So those kinds of things tend to, you know, become the first things in the queue that we've got to address. Um, you know, hopefully over time, <laughs> <laughs> things will, you know, mature a little bit and we'll get to a point where th we'll have a bit more of an equilibrium and we'll be able to focus more. How about yeah. the role of the, the chief data officer? We heard today, uh, earlier from uh, Stuart, that, that the earliest that the MIT Sloan School could find an uh, official chief data officer was 2003. Right. And uh, how do you see, well, first of all, a question. What percent of organizations have a, a CDO? Maybe you don't know broadly, but I'd love your gut feel, or maybe you can answer specifically yeah. to financial services. It's, it's very small uh, in terms of actually carrying that title. Mm. Uh, I think a lot of people are doing some of the role of a CDO, but they don't necessarily carry the title and they don't have the, uh, yeah, th th they haven't reached that, that level of maturity yet. Do you think it's single digits, less than 10%? In, in I think it is, yes, yeah. less than 10%. And, and, and so well, financial services presumably would be one that would adopt that role sooner, wouldn't you say? Or Very much so. I mean, at, at all the, the conferences, the big data conferences and the CDO conferences around, um, it's mainly the financial industry that's there. So yeah, I, I believe that's the main area. Yeah, so I mean, you know, obviously data science, you know, the data scientist role is, 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 is it reminds me, I wonder if it's going to take a similar path. It, it probably won't. This is probably a, a horrible analogy, but I'll throw it out there anyway. Remember the webmaster? Yes. Right, everybody wanted to be a webmaster, now everybody right. wants to be a data scientist, and that role sort of evolved yes. uh, and, and morphed. I think that the most data scientists that I know um, are probably significantly more senior and qualified than most webmasters that I knew back, you know, 12, 15 <laughs> years ago. But, uh, but nonetheless, how do you see that, that, that role evolving, and how do you see the adoption of, 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 of that title, that, that role within organizations, and, 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 and should it be faster? Absolutely, I'd love it to be faster, and, and I think it will. I think it's. I don't think it's the, the growth path is going to be a you know straight line. I, I do think it's going to be uh, something that's going to accelerate. Um, so I it's kind of S-curvish. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, an old guy. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Use my old math terms. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I believe that you know the data scientist uh, you know has together with the data uh, the, the chief data officer have have an, a, a tremendous opportunity to. Uh, to capture the imagination of the organization. Um, the data scientists, um, in, in my book, are, are people that would either work side by side with the chief data officer or on the chief data officer's staff um, and uh, would be really strong in uh, the ability to not only mine into the data and use all the right sort of data modeling techniques, but to be able to visualize it. I think that's the one of the key um, skills that, that we're going to be looking for, is people who've got the artistic flair to be able to take this myriad of facts and present it in a way that's an indisputable uh, message um, that you could pull someone off the street and say, what does that mean? And they'll tell you immediately what it means. I think that's, that's going to be the key skill. So you own the data architecture, right? Is that is that fair? Or yeah, I I, I own just conceptually. Uh, so uh, so I, I'm really a, a part of the business. Yep. So um, and so what I've taken is I've got data governance, I've got enterprise analytics. Um, so that's where the data scientists are. Yep. Uh, I've got the data architecture side, which I drew out of the IT shop, and I've also got data development, which I also drew out of the IT shop. So those are my four pillars. So my group is called Enterprise Data and Analytics. So it's, it's both sides of the coin, end and to end. And those are direct reporting relationships. Direct you reporting. And they've got what, a uh, dotted line into their, their, their adjacent 
roles or no dotted no, line no roles? Dotted line. So the guys that Direction. you pulled out of IT, the, yeah. the, the, from the data architecture piece, yep. report directly into you, yep. no dotted line. No dotted line. Interesting. Yeah. And and how did that go, you know, organizationally? Was uh, <laughs> it went well. Yeah. It so went really well. I think the <laughs> CIO was <really> great. <laughs> <laughs> Take this problem. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> I can imagine that conversation. No, for, fortunately, we've got a really, you know, uh, our CIO, our CTO, and our app dev lead uh, really, uh, you know, understand the need for a concerted mm. effort on, on the uh, data side. And so, you know, they've been tremendously supportive. They understood that was a, a root problem. Uh, yeah. That if you solve, to your what you described before, if you solve that root problem, a lot of things downstream you get resolved and then adds business value much faster. So Absolutely. Uh, I, I think that that's, that's probably somewhat unique, uh, but you guys are in the financial services business, so you make decisions right. fast because it's the, all about the, the, the buck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> get it done yesterday. Yeah. Right. yeah. All right, good. Well, Derek, listen, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. It was really a pleasure uh, meeting you. Good luck. And Thank you. Uh, and, yeah. and hope Appreciate to see it. you down the road. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll be right back after this to wrap it up. Uh, myself, Dave Vellante, with Jeff Kelly. This is theCUBE. We're live here at the MIT Information Quality Symposium. Keep it right there for our wrap-up.